Hey guys, Francis here. Welcome back. So how do we minimize the matrix interference? The answer is, we can use the standard addition method, which a known and increasing amount of a standard analyte solution is added to equal amounts of the sample. For example, let's say we have a sample X. We can add 5 ml of sample X in each 50 ml volumetric flask followed by adding a known and increasing amount of standard analyte solution. And finally, top up each volumetric flask to the mark. The concentration of the analyte in the sample can be obtained from the x-intercept of the calibration curve, even though the standard addition method can be used to minimize the metric interference, there is one drawback. The whole process is very time consuming. If you are dealing with one or two sample, that's still manageable. However, in the industry, imagine using the standard addition method for 10, 20, or even 50 samples. It's going to be very time consuming. Therefore, in the real world context, before we try minimizing the metric interference, it may be better to investigate the metric interference to see if there's a need to use the standard addition method. So in the last part of this video, we're going to learn how to investigate the metric interference by computing the percentage recovery. In the context of analytical chemistry, this is part of the method validation. Previously, we had talked about how to preserve water samples by treating them with nitric acid, how to perform quantitative analysis by using external calibrations with multi-element standards, and finally, in order to investigate the matrix interference, we need to spike all our samples with a known amount of multi-element standard. The sample preparation for the spike sample is very similar to that of the raw sample that we have discussed previously, with one additional step. That is, to add a known amount of multi-element standard in the volumetric flask before topping the solution up to the mug with the filtered water sample. So in brief, the lineup for the auto sampler may look something like this, where the first knife slot is used for the blanks and the multi-element standards for calibration purposes. Samples treated with nitric acid will be used for quantitative analysis. The spike samples will be used to investigate the matrix interference. And lastly, 10% nitric acid and ultra pure water will be used to rinse the whole system at the end of the ICPAES analysis. So after collecting the experimental results, how do we compute or calculate the percentage recovery? Well, it can be calculated using this simple equation. The percentage recovery is equal to the difference between the spike sample concentration and the raw sample concentration, divided by the concentration of the spike multi-element standard, multiplied by 100%. So if we expand this equation a little bit, this will be equal to concentration of your raw sample plus the spike concentration that we obtain experimentally minus the concentration of the raw sample divided by the spike concentration that we plan multiplied by 100%. So the concentration of raw sample will cancel out each other and then we are left off with the spike concentration obtained experimentally and the spike concentration that we plan, multiply by 100%. Therefore, if the matrix interference is minimal, the percentage recovery should be close to 100%. According to the EPA protocol for the ICP AES analysis of water samples, if the percentage recovery falls within the range of 70% to 130%, the results will be considered as acceptable. What if the percentage recovery falls beyond this range? Well, this is where the standard addition methods comes in. However, instead of using a multi-element standard for the standard addition, we can simply use one or a mixture of single element standards for the elements with the percentage recovery falls beyond the acceptable range. Congrats, you have just completed the e-lecture series of ICP AES. Let's have a quick summary on what we have learned so far. First of all, 
we have learned about the why we use ICP-AES. And it's not just for elemental analysis, it's for trace elemental analysis, which allow us to analyze sample with very low concentration in the PPB region. That's why ICP-AES is widely used in these important industries. Secondly, we have learned what AES is and the working principles behind AES. Where we discuss the different colors we see in fireworks is actually due to the atomic emission of different metal salt present. The three major steps in AES involve the atomization and the excitation, which can be achieved with the use of a flame or ICP, followed by a relaxation back to the ground state, giving up the energy as atomic emissions. Thirdly, we have learned what ICP is and how plasma is generated in ICP. We have discussed the use of a nebulizer to introduce liquid samples into the system as fine droplets. Then we cover in detail how plasma is generated in ICP. In the final part of this e-lecture series, we took a closer look at the experimental design, where we learned how to collect and prepare the samples with nitric acid how to perform quantitative analysis in ICP-AES using external calibration, and how to investigate the metric interference by spiking the sample with multi-element standards and examine the percentage recovery for each of the elements of interest. Hope you have enjoyed this e-lecture series on ICP-AES. Thumbs up if you liked it. See you guys next time. Bye.